Welcome, my name is Dr John Paul Hayes. I'm a Senior Lecturer in Strategy and Responsible Management at the University of Eastland. Today I'm going to be talking about working across organisational boundaries. What it is, why it's important and what is exciting about it. There are various terms used to describe inter-organisational activities. For example, a strategic alliance, coalition, a collaboration, a federation, a network, a joint venture, a relationship, a cluster, and so on. These multiple meanings have a number of different uh, of explanations, and none are universally accepted. Now, whilst there are various terms, all describe how organisations do something together. So, for example, Apple and Google at the moment, working together to develop contract tracing apps in the response to the COVID pandemic. You also have examples of Uber and Hyundai partnering to develop flying taxis. Now, as soon as we start to look at how organisations do things, we're interested in the relationships between them, particularly how they maintain them and how they develop these relationships. Now, looking at the connections between organisations, we can start to look at the structure of an inter-organisational relationship or an inter-organisational collaboration. Inter-organisational relationships can be simply depicted by looking at the connections between your organisation and other organisations, or by looking at the particular activity that the organisations are working on together. For example, Google, Apple, the NHS, and other government agencies in, the de in developing the new app. Or, in a sense, those involved in neighbourhood regeneration, residents, the local council, charities working in the area, and private sector organisations who are active in employing local uh, residents. So all this really sort of starts to think about looking at the links um, in a particular geographical area. Um, now this sets out visually this idea of looking at the connections, uh, how structures, how organisations are linked, and how inter-organisation relationships and collaboration is structured. Now not all relationships and collaborations are the same. Organisations have relationships and, and a collaboration um, with other organisations for different purposes. Uh, these can be distinguished on the level of formality and dependence between the, the organisations involved. If we think of it as a spectrum, uh, we have the more integrated and formalised uh, inter-organisation relationships at one end, uh, to thinking about the other end where the more simple transactional relationships are. For example, if we think about the more integrated and formalised ones, we're thinking about joint ventures, equity investments, uh, moving more to those that are sort of more strategic alliances, any sort of licensing arrangements, to much more towards the other end of the transactional relationships, which are sort of typical, simple market relations. Now, in understanding the type of relationship structure, we can start to think about how individuals and organisations use them. So, for example, in transactional relationships, the expectation is much more that they're going to be short term, it's based very much on competition, where you've got a lot of different choice, and you're looking at sort of suppliers with different specialisations. In that particular sense, you're looking for economies of scale, areas for innovation. Typically, there'll be one contact between each different organisations, but there'll be many relationships, so you'll have a number of different possible suppliers. And looking very much for outsourcing flexibility, uh, and using typically formal processes, such as contracts, to be able to carry out and control the activity. However, if we look much more at the other end of the spectrum, um, where there's more integration, and more, uh, uh, we're looking at much more collaborative relationships. Now, these relationships typically, in contrast, much more long-term, set out in a way to develop sort of shared coordination, looking at problem solving, learning, developing a sense of success together, and with that, there'll be multiple contacts within an organisation and typically few relationships for this particular type of activity. Now, in contrast to the transactional relationships, this is much, much more of a social process. And by that, it's much more de developing between the individuals involved, building trust, commitment. Uh, and so when we start to sort of categorise these different relationships, the understanding the type of relationship can help appreciate how uh, it can be handled in practice. Now, inter-organisations are known 
to emerge from the formal legal infor and informal processes, but they also can be altered, and particularly they're typically altered by the more informal social psychological norms and trusts um, of those that are involved. That's everything from the individuals to the organizations. They are hence very dynamic and depend on social processes to build and maintain trust, commitment, and control. Overall, this approach emphasizes looking at you know, what resources organizations depend on and from whom. Uh, organizations try to retain their autonomy, but have to engage with others to obtain resources and achieve their goals. Now, if we just take a step and think about the cost involved, and particularly the cost of governing the interorganizational relationships, uh, what economic, economic, economists have looked into this, in particular looking into account for, uh, for efficiency. So in that respect, in looking at the structure, uh, this sets out really which transactions or activities should be carried out uh, through the market uh, relationships, either through hierarchies, so within an organization, or through more hybrid and collaborative relationships. Uh, in particular, the costs of governing uh, of these activities, you know, whether it's about developing a product, uh, a simple transaction, um, varies in each of these different types of arrangements, you know, whether you're doing it through a market relationship, whether you're doing it internally through a hierarchy, or through a collaborative relationship. Uh, and this in particular relates to, to prioritizing the importance of the activities that, uh, that the organization does. Uh, with those that are less important, Uh, carried out by other organizations. So, for example, a market structure uh, um, uh, arrangement is particularly has optimal efficiency for very low important activities, a hybrid sort of relationship, more collaborative ones for medium important activities, and a hierarchy for any sort of uh, activities that are very important to the success uh, of that organization. So we've quickly really introduced uh, what different forms of interorganizations can be, you know, based on dependence and integration, uh, along with taking into account the efficiency of interactions of relationships. Uh, the, and this really sets out typical thinking in terms of uh, private sector relationships. Now, a specific type of interorganization relationships that captures working across public and private sectors is known as public-private partnerships. These typically started in the 1990s They've been popular across the world in the UK, the USA, Canada, Japan, China, and Africa. Uh, and in particular, they've been supported some, by some very large institutions, such as the World Bank, uh, the International Finance Corporation. But at the same time, um, these have also been seen as a sense of public procurement, so very much the government outsourcing or contracting out its activities. And a general sense is needed, really, I suppose, in taking care in setting up the relationship, uh, thinking about the variety of relationships between the public and private sector, uh, and also the variety of areas. You know, this has been used for everything from education to energy to roads and housing. Uh, and as with most activities, there's been a variety of successes and a variety of failures. So a lot of opportunity to learn and understand how they work and whether or not they're suitable for the activity that you're looking at. Now, PPPs are not the only way organizations work across public, private, and third stroke plural sectors. Here, there's also the theory of collaborative advantage, which captures really the potential to achieve something that could not otherwise be achieved through working across organizational and sector boundaries. This recognizes the different resources, uh, experience and expertise people have, uh, and are often needed to address a problem. It also highlights the difficulties. It can be slow, hard work, complex, you know, where you've got multiple organizations with different ways of working, very messy, ambiguous, and have a highly changeable membership in terms of the collaborative activities. This points to reflecting also, in addition to a collaborative advantage, there's this thing called a collaborative inertia that people experience when working in collaborations. So really in this quick session, I've started to cover you know, what we consider as interorganization relationships or interorganizational collaboration, uh, but clearly we need to ask the question, you know, why are they important? Hopefully there have been some hints into what has already been covered. First, um, most organizations do not have a monopoly on all of the smart people. So to innovate, you can, you can look beyond your organization for ideas, to look for a better business model, to broker knowledge, 
and critically to bring those ideas into the organization, sort of capture and claim some of that value for your organization. Now, second, lots of problems are complex and require contribution from different technical specialists. So from creating the next running trainer in new product development, to responding to traffic accidents, trying to alleviate global poverty, so various different social properties, or address global pandemics such as COVID, as an example of Apple and Google working together. And these all require input from different specialists, you know, different organizations, different sources of finance, and all somehow need to be combined, coordinated to develop something to address the problem. Third, we are now more likely to work across organizations and disciplines than we were in the past. And with the advent of the knowledge economy and increasing specializations in each field, this has led to multiple smaller specialist organizations that provide in-depth detailed knowledge. Fourth, growth is often cited as a key to an organization's success. This isn't just simply the private sector, but it is something that is often there. It's predominantly the, uh, and it is there that can, can facilitate growth through options to do with joint ventures, strategic alliances. Still, across the public, private, and third plural sectors, it can often be seen, though, as central to an organization's strategy. Hence, collaboration, inter-organization relationships are often promoted by professional associations, public agencies, not-for-profits, and intergovernmental organizations. That's everything from you know, where I'm at, at the University of East London, to large uh, engineering associations such as the um, association uh, such as ASME in the US, um, the United Nations, uh, not for profits such as the Partnering uh, the Initiative, and, uh, and, and, and local ed um, enterprise partnerships, which are particularly relevant uh, for looking at regeneration in the UK at the moment. Now, Understanding inter-organisational relationships uh, or inter-organisational collaboration is important as bringing together organisations creates a new context for them to work in. You know, typically, this context is quite transient. You know, with work carried out in time-limited projects, with membership changing over time as organisations change what they can or cannot contribute. In bringing together these different organisations, there is an increase in the complexity of how collaborative activities are carried out. Since no longer under hier hierarchy or market relations, there are multiple ways of getting things done that often involves uh, a continuous discourse uh, and discussion and debate about developing what is appropriate. This often leads to a space where ambiguity is the norm. You know, who is involved, in what capacity, uh, and, and where membership is not necessarily clear. You know, who are the individuals? What are they representing? Is it themselves, the organisation, a different group? You know, dynamics themselves are also very uh, less predictable, that's both within the project, uh, within the relationship between the different organisations, between the membership, and how decisions themselves are actually made. Which can all can really have unforeseen impacts uh, through the relationship structure. You know, one example in that sense would be thinking about, you know, the bullwhip bull effect we see in supply chains and how things happening at one point in time can have quite a significant impact upon things downstream. Now, individuals and organizations have to create, develop, and maintain this collaborative space. This takes time and effort, and is not guaranteed to be success for all of the participants. Now, what is exciting about inter-organizational relationships, inter-organizational collaboration? Now, having given some insight into what they are, I'd like to consider what's exciting about them. If we start by looking at the external environment that we're all in, it is clear that there's a lot of uncertainty about what our society will be in both the short and long-term future. Researchers looking at procurement and supply management have identified a number of megatrends that will have a transformative and disruptive effect on organizations. Now, this covers political shifts and in international trade agreements, climate change, digitalizations, societal change. You know, these are areas where, which are dramatically affecting inter-organizational relationships and inter-organizational collaboration. It's exciting to start to understand how organizations are considering these megatrends and working with other organizations to influence what we can do to address them. In looking at working in collaboration, collaborations, it is interesting and useful to consider the idea of management tensions. Now, management tensions recognize that there are competing and conflicting approaches to achieving an outcome that are directly linked together. So, for example, in looking at 
to achieve you know, good practice in governance and in the collaboration, it's seen important to, to work towards both unity in decision making, yet also allowing the diversity of perspectives and approaches. It's also seen to important to encourage involvement in the processes, but also to work towards carrying out things efficiently. Now, each of these things is at odds with each other. Now, hence, working in collaboration has been described as often as inherently paradoxical. Now, this is particularly as exciting as it asks researchers and practitioners to move away from simplified and polarized ideas about management of interorganization relationships and interorganizational collaboration. Now, to consider how each part is linked together by exploring the relationship between those competing and conflicting approaches and understanding how to live with the management tension to achieve a more collaborative outcome. Now, ultimately, maintaining collaborative relationships is about time and effort you have to put into them. You know, nurture, nurture, nurture is the mantra of some researchers. You know, leading for, uh, for collaborative advantage is seen as a mix of embracing, empowering, involving and mobilizing participants whilst playing the politics and manipulating the agenda. It's a challenging mix and it's exciting as participants in collaborations need to consider you know, some of the basics. You know, what are you collaborating for? Do you need to collaborate? What does each person organization bring? You know, what type of relationships are, are, are there? How, do, how can you achieve and maintain a collaborative advantage? You know, whilst being aware of a number of different challenges, you know, there's balancing your interests, other stakeholders' interests, and those of the group, the collaboration together. You know, having a vision, but with a less clear or fixed path of how to get there. You know, and also working with the idea and, and the spirit of collaboration, but being mindful of having to be quite uh, brutish in the sense to sometimes get things done. And then lastly, the challenge in the sense, the sense of transience, you know, coping with this element of regular change. So in summary, I've covered what are interorganizational relationships uh, and interorganizational collaboration, you know, why they are important and what is interesting about them at the moment. They exist in a space that is complex, ambiguous and dynamic. They require time and effort to understand and be successful. You know, working in an interorganizational relationship or interorganizational collaboration may not be the best way for you to achieve your work. You know, at UEL, uh, interorganizational relationships uh, are a part of a number of modules across a variety of conference uh, courses. And I welcome you to consider joining us to explore and investigate them further. In particular, you know, the modules uh, that I would recommend uh, uh, and the courses that, 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 they, that they come up on uh, uh, relate to you know, business management, BSc program, the MBA program, and the NGO management. Thank you for taking the time to listen and do get in touch uh, with us at UEL if you wish to find out more about studying.